Hello, welcome to the Carbon Removal Challenge webinar series. We are here, we're very lucky to be joined by our excellent first guest, Grant Faber, who is not only uh, presenting tonight on Intro to CDR, but is also uh, organizing our entire educational calendar. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Grant. Yeah, of course. Thanks Grant, for having me. The uh, founder and president of Carbon Based Consulting, uh, a really excellent organization that is uh, well, I'll let you talk about it a little bit yourself, Grant, so that uh, uh, I don't steal your thunder here. But uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, I am, uh, I started recording. Yes, okay. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, Grant's going to give us some really great information. So I'm going to turn the floor over to you. Thanks so much, Grant. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, hi, everyone. Yeah, happy to be here and to be talking about carbon removal on this wonderful uh, Thursday evening in January. Uh, my name is Grant Faber. I'm the founder and president of Carbon Based Consulting. Uh, so it's just an independent consultancy working with carbon removal, carbon management startups more generally, on uh, life cycle assessment and techno-economic assessment, which is actually what we'll be talking about uh, next week for our uh, Carbon Removal Challenge educational session. But this week I'm going to be giving a kind of a more general introduction to carbon removal. Um, and so I will share my screen. Oh, Matt, could you enable uh, the screen sharing, please? Um, and yeah, so should be sure good now, Grant. Sorry about that. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so let's see. Hopefully, this is screen share is loading. Um, okay, so hopefully this is working here, it, and I will go into slideshow mode. So yeah, so hopefully this is showing up. So yeah, this week we're just going to talk about again introduction to carbon dioxide removal what it is, what the different pathways are, some important aspects of it, uh, and why it's so important for helping solve our climate challenge. And I just wanted to note at the beginning as well that we will share the deck afterwards. This is just on Google Slides, so we'll share it out. And then the sources for the various slides can be found in the speaker note comments on the bottom. So to start, just to give a little bit of context here, emissions are rising. You know, I imagine that most people in the audience, most people watching are already very well aware of this. You know, if you're participating in this competition, if you're just a young person who pays you know, any attention to what's going on in the world, you'll know that emissions are rising. Uh, you know, now there are signs, there are reports that are coming out that say, oh, we may be approaching a plateau and then emissions may start dropping soon within a few years, partially because of all the progress that's been going on in, in clean tech and uh, increased awareness surrounding our climate challenge. However, as of right now, emissions are higher, more or less than they've ever been. Um, for certain countries that might be coming down, but in terms of the overall planet, emissions are as high as they've ever been. Um, and so we're at about, you know, depending on how you calculate it, if you look at just CO2 emissions or CO2 equivalent, or if you include land use, et cetera, we're in that kind of 40 to 50 billion metric ton per year range. Uh, in order to be compatible with intergovernmental panel on climate change goals and, and goals laid out in the, the Paris Agreement, you know, we'll want to maybe cut that in half or so uh, within the decade here, and then hopefully take that to at zero, where we won't be adding to the atmospheric CO2 concentration at all by 2050. So that's a huge challenge we're facing. One quick thing I'll note about this figure here is that this just includes you know, current anthropogenic emissions, but the more we emit, the more we risk inducing, reinforcing, or positive feedback loops in the global climate. So this is the stuff you may have heard about with respect to you know, changing albedo as the ice melts and the ground is darker, so it doesn't reflect as much heat, and then it absorbs more heat. Um, or maybe melting permafrost is another popular example. And many of these uh, are at risk of getting much worse over time, and then adding a lot of um, extra biological emissions that aren't directly from an anthropogenic or human caused source, but that still will contribute to the climate problem. And so the faster we can uh, reduce the emissions we're putting into the air, and then also reduce our atmospheric concentrations, which I'll talk more about momentarily, the more we can reduce the risk of those feedback loops um, occurring, which will make our climate challenge a lot worse and a lot harder to solve. So on this next slide, I have this uh, really nice pie chart from Our World and Data that I reference all the time for personal use um, and, and just trying to understand like where these emissions are coming from. And I think this graphic does a really good job at showing all of the different 
sources of uh, CO2 and methane and nitrous oxide, et cetera. This is um, in CO2 equivalent, uh, all, the, all these different sources of emissions that are contributing to our increasing atmospheric concentration of, of CO2. So you can see that the largest chunk is energy, second largest chunk is agriculture and land use, and we have these smaller categories for industry and waste. Um, I'll note that, you know, there's different classifications you can see uh, of, of this kind of chart. Um, and why I say that is over here, you have energy use in industry. And so some charts you might see might say like, oh, 25% or 20% industry or something uh, along those lines in terms of a contribution of that sector to global emissions. But that's just because of different classifications. Uh, I t again, I tend to like this chart because it gives a pretty good, pretty good breakdown. And so you can see that, you know, there's all these different categories contributing to, to the climate challenge. And, and if we want to reach net zero, in a sense, we'll have to find solutions for every single one of these categories. Now that will be complicated a little bit by what I'm going to talk about today, carbon removal. Um, in some sense, we couldn't just reduce emissions primarily, you know, maybe by 90% from some of the largest chunks on this graph, and then use carbon removal to reach this uh, net zero where we won't be adding you know, CO2 to the atmosphere every year. Uh, and then it will potentially save costs and allow us to address some of these hard to abate emissions. Now, the extent to which we should do that is controversial. I'll touch on that a little later in the presentation today. But to start, it's important to just have a high level understanding that there are a lot of different sectors that contribute to the climate problem. And it's easier to decarbonize some of these sectors rather than others. So given that chart that we just looked at, um, and given this need to reduce what we're you know, spewing into the atmosphere now, um, there are some primary solutions to emissions. And now many of these you've probably seen before, you've learned about uh, in class or discussed, or you might even try to implement some of these in your own lives. But uh, one of the largest ones um, and also some, to some extent, a, a, a relatively neglected one is energy efficiency. So simply just using less energy to still meet our economic goals. And so there's a ton of energy wasted, for example, in heating and cooling of buildings. You know, it's middle of winter. I'm located in Michigan right now. And our apartment is just very, very poorly insulated. And I can just feel, you know, the heat just like pouring out of the apartment and so I believe our building has a natural gas boiler. And so that boiler has to work, heat up water, run it through our heater, but then that energy is just spewing out into the environment. Uh, and if our building had better insulation and you know, we've tried to do the best we can at, at adding insulation, but um, you know, it's, it's still not perfect. And some of the stuff is structural and has to do with, with the building. Um, if we were to have much better insulation, we would just use less, like the building would just use less natural gas produce less CO2, but we would still be warm in the winter. And sadly, this is a massive issue all over the world. It's just wasting tons of energy. Uh, there's losses that occur from using fossil-based sources as well. There's uh, limited efficiencies in terms of how much energy you can extract out of a fossil resource in a combustion uh, power plant, which uh, is a type of energy inefficiency, but intersects with the next point, which is low carbon energy. So often when people think about solving climate change, they're thinking about solar panels, wind turbines, maybe nuclear plants, geothermal, hydroelectric, and so forth. And more or less those sources of energy generally are much better than where we primarily get our electricity from, coal and natural gas uh, in many parts of the world. Uh, and this low carbon energy, it extends to other industries as well. So to make concrete, you need cement. And to get cement, you need very high temperatures uh, to calcine limestone. And those high temperatures are often achieved via combustion of coal in a kiln. And so finding a way that we could maybe decarbonize that process, there would still be some inherent CO2 emissions associated with cement manufacturing, which is uh, potentially covered by the last point in this list, which we'll get to in a moment. But switching out that coal component to low carbon energy is a way that we can start to eat into some of those industrial energy use emissions as well. Uh, relatedly, uh, there are some, there's some potential to electrify certain industries. So manufacturing ammonia, uh, fertilizer, NH3 is a vital, it's, it's a vital commodity for our agricultural systems that we can fertilize crops to grow food, to uh, feed people and, and keep food cheap. Um, but 
the majority of ammonia is derived from natural gas that's fed into the Haber-Bosch process today. Some companies are investigating a way that we can electrify that process, use renewable electricity and um, electrolyze water with it to get hydrogen, combine it with nitrogen from the atmosphere, and then get NH3, get that uh, ammonia for use, but in a much uh, less impactful way. So that's an example of electrification of industry. And then of course, electrification of transport, maybe the second most popular uh, climate solution, depending on, on how you're measuring it, electric vehicles. You know, if we can electrify our cars that we drive every day, uh, and trucks and boats and motorcycles and all these other things that currently for the most part burn uh, petrochemical derived or petroleum-based fuels. Um, that's of course going to have a significant impact. Uh, eating less meat and dairy uh, is another way. I mean, you know, we can fulfill many of our dietary needs by not consuming these very uh, emissions intensive and environmental impact intensive products. And so uh, general behavioral shifts and policy changes that can encourage people to eat less meat and less dairy, uh, of course, helps take a big, will help take a big chunk out of those uh, agricultural emissions. And similarly, better agricultural and land use practices, um, you know, using nitrogen fixing plants, maybe we don't have to use as much ammonia in the soil, um, creating better incentives so that people don't deforest their land or um, there, there is some overlap with some carbon removal methods that I'll, I'll talk about uh, later on in the presentation here as well that maybe relate to no-till agriculture and soil carbon sequestration. But in general, better and more respectful practices um, can lead to lower land use emissions and lower anthropogenic agricultural emissions as well, which is key. And then finally on this list, point source carbon capture. So of a lot of these sources that I showed on the previous slide, these sources of emissions, they're you know, pretty powerful, um, or, they're, or they're pretty intense uh, and centralized point sources. So you might have, you know, a large power plant just spewing CO2 into the atmosphere every year. Uh, many of those plants, it would be ideal if we could, you know, shut them down, figure out a different way to obtain the value that's provided by those plants. But um, in certain cases, for instance, in the steel industry, it may not always be possible or may not be possible in time to figure out an alternative solution. And there are well-developed methods for taking that CO2 that would otherwise be released, stripping it from the rest of the exhaust gases coming from the plant, and then finding a way to either put that into some kind of permanent product, such as concrete, or potentially injecting it underground for permanent geological storage. And so, um, you know, point source carbon capture, it's a little controversial. Some people say, oh, well, we should use, you know, point source carbon capture for natural gas and coal plants. Um, and that will help reduce their impact while still providing us that base load and dispatchable electricity that those plants can provide. Um, you know, it's controversial because some people say, well, that's, you know, just cover for the fossil fuel industry. And we should be seeking to eradicate those plants altogether. Um, so yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, and I'll, I guess on that point, I'll note that the portfolio of solutions that we have um, like the extent to which we pursue every individual solution is a little bit subject to um, debate. And it's kind of a political thing, like uh, how much less meat and dairy should people be eating? Of course, it's a very personal and, and political issue. You know, how much should we, um, how much of, uh, pure renewable energy should we use versus you know, this point source capture for natural gas plants or something uh, along those lines. Um, and it gets deeply political as you kind of dive into which set of solutions to use. So uh, even though we kind of know these mainstream solutions and we want to incentivize as many as we can, as, as much as we can, um, it, it can be sometimes a, a little tricky. But anyway, so yes, yeah, so that's just context and the general climate challenge we're facing and some of the main solutions. But what we're here to talk about tonight is carbon removal, carbon dioxide removal or CDR, which is an emerging climate solution. And so I've pasted a few different definitions of carbon removal in here. Some of you may be more familiar um, with this than others, but what I'll note is that, you know, a, a general trend across these definitions is that you're taking atmospheric CO2, uh, potentially ocean oceanic CO2 as well, which in the case where you're taking that, the idea is to draw more from the atmosphere. So you're taking the CO2 that we've emitted previously, and then you want to capture it in such a way that you can uh, clearly manage it and then 
uh, ideally inject it underground, say, or react it with minerals for some kind of permanent uh, long-term storage. Now, there's also um, short-term storage. You know, there's ways that we could say bubble that CO2 through um, like a controlled pond to grow algae and then use that algae to make an algal biofuel that we could then use as a carbon neutral fuel. Uh, and that's, you know, could be a good way to displace petroleum uh, derived fuels, but we'd have to note that the CO2 that's in that algae you know, came from the atmosphere, but when that fuel is combusted, it would be returning to the atmosphere. So it'd be circular. It wouldn't be like permanently or even for a meaningful amount of time removing that carbon from the atmosphere. Often when people talk about carbon dioxide removal, they're talking about methods that can reliably reduce atmospheric concentrations of CO2. So, um, you know, the extent to which uh, that is stored, you know, permanence is something I'll talk about a little later on in, in the presentation, uh, but that's something to keep in mind. Generally, when we're talking about carbon removal, we're trying to do something that decreases atmospheric concentrations of CO2. And like I'm noting on the bottom here, uh, CDR is technically different from carbon capture. Um, sometimes people use the, the terms interchangeably. You know, they might just say carbon capture for any kind of process that's, you know, capturing CO2 or kind of um, like separating uh, CO2 from, from other gases. And in some sense, yeah, it's, you know, it's all kind of carbon capture. You know, people call direct air capture, sometimes direct air carbon capture, which has carbon capture in the name. So it's a bit murky, but uh, the important point to note is that there's carbon removal, which again, like I said, can has the potential to reduce atmospheric CO2 concentrations, and then uh, point source carbon capture or fossil carbon capture. In the majority of instances, that is just preventing fossil carbon from reaching the atmosphere, and so it's more of uh, it's more about emissions reduction of an existing source rather than actually reducing that atmospheric CO2 concentration. Uh, both, of course, are necessary. So why, why carbon removal? You know, why is it one of these emerging climate solutions? Why didn't people, you know, talk about it more 20 years ago when, when climate was just starting to get a little more popular? Well, um, people working on, on climate change, you know, the various scholars around the world who are trying to create plans for how our society can decarbonize have realized these kind of main points. And um, I've uh, borrowed this specific framing from uh, Zeke Hausfather uh, and, and uh, modified it a bit and, and added uh, one or two things. But um, uh, he had a presentation on this as CDR through the Open Air Collective on, on CDR math, where he kind of talked about these these reasons uh, for for why we're in this situation where where we need carbon removal. So this first one I alluded to before, managing hard to abate CO two emissions. So there are certain sectors that we might not be able to figure out uh, an alternative decarbonization strategy for uh, by 2050. So shipping, for example, you know, we have these ships, uh, these huge um, container ships that transport uh, many of the goods that we have in our everyday lives. They transport them all around the ocean. Uh, these use bunker fuel, you know, it's kind of this dirty fuel, um, obviously derived from oil, just spewing CO2 into the atmosphere. Um, and that's how these ships are designed. You know, some of them may, so some of these ships uh, are rolling off production lines today. They might be planning to uh, be operational for, you know, decades longer. Um, and of course, interestingly, there are some companies that are trying to figure out how to retrofit those ships and add carbon capture units onto them, or maybe use, you know, some of that green ammonia I was talking about before as a fuel for it, which would be interesting. Um, but in the event that we can't figure that uh, that kind of stuff out, or that it's too slow to deploy, or that it's simply just too expensive, there's a world in which, um, in order to reach net zero, we're uh, to a point where we're not adding you know CO two to the atmosphere every year as quickly as possible. It would make sense to just continue um, emitting with the ship, and then separately remove CO two from the atmosphere. And then maybe ideally make the shipping company uh, cover the cost of that to kind of fulfill a polluter pays principle and to ensure that that uh, cost is not externalized onto the rest of society. But anyway, there can be these hard to abate CO2 emissions. Uh, and the point of carbon capture and storage, at CCS there, um, many of these carbon capture systems might only capture 90% of the CO2 and they emit the rest. So 
90% emissions reduction from something like a steel plant or natural gas plant, it's pretty good, but it's still 10%. And CO2 is cumulative in the atmosphere. So even if we cut emissions by 90% and we're at that 10% level, well, we'd still be adding CO2 to the atmosphere every year. So we would still ultimately reach these higher emissions futures. It would just take longer. Um, and of course, CO2 does eventually get processed out of the atmosphere, but it can be on a very long time scale. So we really do need to get to net zero to solve the problem. Carbon removal will probably be necessary to help with that. Um, similarly, number two, there is there can be non-CO2 emissions, you know, these, these other greenhouse gases like methane and nitrous oxide and sulfur hexa hexafluoride. And we, again, may not be able to come up with strategies to eliminate the uh, these, these emissions, it might be from uh, degraded wetlands or something, uh, and there's some kind of CO2 or CH4 spewing into the atmosphere, or maybe there's some level of animal agriculture that's still going on in 2050, which is probably pretty likely, um, you know, farming cows, and those cows are going to belch methane, which and it, methane might come from their manure, which then accumulates in the atmosphere, uh, and, and we got to compensate for that if we want to stop warming, and so carbon removal might be a way to do that. Uh, number three, lowering global temperature upon overshoot. So this is a case in which we overshoot our goals. Say our goal is two degrees Celsius, you know, average warming by 2050. Uh, but let's say we emit too much and it's 2.6 degrees by that time. Carbon removal is the only way that other than geoengineering, which can be very risky and controversial, but carbon removal is basically the, you know, the most realistic or probably the only way that we would be able to get that 2.6 degrees Celsius back to two degrees Celsius, back to 1.5 and so forth. And it's actually related to number six, which I'll cover now, which is restoring the climate. Um, if we want to, you know, restore the climate to pre-industrial conditions, which is super ambitious and would require the removal of potentially trillions of tons of CO2 that we've emitted since the beginning of the industrial revolution, more or less sustained you know, net carbon removal each year is, is the only way we're going to achieve that unless we're talking you know, hundreds of thousands of years in, into the future. And even then it, we could be setting off feedback loops that are just leading to these irreversible changes in, in the climate. So you know, carbon removal um, allows us the, the allows humanity the potential to restore the climate to a pre-industrial state within centuries rather than having to wait tens or hundreds of thousands of years. And so that's uh, again, it's kind of ambitious and, and very like visionary use of this technology, but, it, but it's powerful and that's why it's you know worth investigating. Uh, and then for number four, hedging against climate sensitivities. So for a given amount of emissions, the climate might warm more than we expect. Uh, just because of issues with modeling um, and like the, the limitations we have with projecting, well, how will the climate actually respond to, you know, each incremental ton of greenhouse gas emissions we're putting up there. And so let's say we emit as much carbon as we budget for, but then the world ends up warming more than, than we expect just because we get unlucky. Um, in that case, carbon removal can, again, help us kind of pull that temperature back. And then five, this is going to be rather controversial, but extending a carbon budget uh, for emerging economies. So there are some who say that, um, you know, uh, development is fueled by high carbon ventures and that uh, the places like the EU and the United States have had, you know, a couple hundred years by this point to just burn as much carbon as we want, gain as much wealth as we want from that. Uh, and that it's kind of unfair to prevent emerging economies from doing the same. Uh, and that therefore the global North should invest in carbon removal to move carbon, to allow emerging economies potentially in, in the global South to emit uh, a little more, maybe build a few more coal plants uh, than, than they would otherwise uh, and that kind of thing. So again, controversial subject to international politics and negotiation, maybe a little tricky, but it is a potential use of this technology. So something to note here too, is that, um, you know, that all the reasons I outlined in the last slide, uh, they're very important, very cool. Uh, but I, I, I want to reemphasize that this like, isn't, isn't really an option. Um, and that if we want to achieve the goals laid out in the 
Paris Agreement of you know limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, it is you know with a high degree of confidence likely uh, that we're going to have to really scale carbon removal uh, from essentially I don't want to say nothing today because there's arguably you know a few hundred million tons of uh, say forestry offsets, many of which are dubious uh, quality, which maybe we'll touch on. Um, but uh, in terms of engineered carbon removal, it's it's low, you know, tens of thousands uh, of tons per year right now. And we need to scale that up to, you know, potentially over 10 billion tons per year, or about 20 to 25% of the current emissions and the current CO2 we put into the atmosphere. I mean, this is a massive endeavor, um, but increasingly likely. It's increasingly one where like we have to do it and we don't really have a choice. Um, and in terms of you know, that actual amount, so I touched on this on the last slide, but again, likely in this like 10 to 20 gigaton per year range by the end of the century. And um, again, just, just to give a sense of the scale. So this, uh, you know, if we use the 10 gigaton figure, that's 20 to 25% of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions that we emit today, uh, which is just absolutely massive. Um, but, you know, maybe some other figures, I think there's about for every year, there's about 400 million tons of plastic that the world produces. And so think of like all the plastic that's produced all around the world. Um, and then multiply that amount by 25. Uh, and like, that's how much volume we're going to have to suck out of the atmosphere every year and like inject underground. I, I mean, this is a massive, uh, massive endeavor. So yeah, so it's, uh, so some people like to say that carbon removal is uh, necessary, but impossible, which um, is, uh, it makes for a good challenge. I think that's why so many people get so captivated uh, by the, by this technology class. So yeah, as I was just, um, I actually just mentioned on, on the last slide. So yeah, there, there's a lot of um, like forestry credits, but a lot of them are, are pretty low quality and you know, they might not actually be having the carbon impacts that, that people expect, or they might be causing other kinds of uh, problems. And of course, uh, a lot of forests might be subject to, to burning um, and other kinds of issues, uh, infestations of pests and so forth, all of which will be exacerbated by a warming climate that may make their carbon sequestration attributes a bit dubious. But um, right now, you know, there is a degree of engineered carbon removal going on. So that's some kind of technological intervention that's removing CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, and right now, it's, it's only at like tens of thousands of tons. And most of this is biochar, which um, biochar has already been uh, manufactured for some time. And so the non-biochar uh, carbon removal methods are really at very, very small volumes. I mean, just today, Climeworks, you know, the one of the most well-known carbon removal, you know, direct air capture companies, uh, it was only just today that they announced they have taken CO2 out of the air, injected it underground, and delivered those tons to a customer. They didn't disclose how many tons, um, maybe because it's a small volume and, and they don't want to, you know, demotivate people or anything, but you know, th this is a huge challenge and we're like just getting started with it. Um, so yeah, I was just talking about Climeworks, but there's a lot of other companies, you know, in this space as well that they are making a lot of progress. And so these, these are pretty positive signs. And often when, you know, a new technology is scaling up, uh, it will scale up super quickly uh, in the beginning and then only level off after it reaches a kind of critical threshold or point. Um, and so fortunately, you know, uh, in the upper left here, we see that there's been a growth rate, uh, at least in terms of purchases, which are distinct from deliveries because people are pre-purchasing uh, carbon removal for future years. So, you know, there's over a 500% growth rate, which, hey, that's pretty good. You know, uh, that's sign. I think that's, I personally think that's a big sign for optimism. Um, you know, and if anyone's familiar with like exponential growth, you know, uh, if you can sustain even like a 10% growth rate year over year, it can, you know, take off. That curve can can explode uh, subject to various, in our case, sustainability constraints uh, and, and energy and resource constraints, which many people are working on classifying and overcoming. Uh, 
But yeah, you can see some of these other big headlines from some of the big, uh, th these are uh, all direct air capture companies, which is just one kind of carbon removal, um, but they're all announcing these you know, megaton scale plants right now. Um, some are uh, purchasing a ton of pore space that's like underground space where they can inject the CO2 for permanent storage. Many of them are um, announcing like huge acquisitions of that. So clearly there's a lot of planning that goes into this. And I didn't even include on this slide the massive amount of funding that this technology class is getting uh, from the recently passed bipartisan infrastructure law and inflation reduction act in the United States. Um, the government, you know, will be pouring billions of dollars into this with already announced already passed legislation, let alone what could come in the future. And all that investment leads to, uh, it's, it's like a catalyst for further private investment as well, uh, which could be, you know, probably tens of billions of more dollars uh, just flowing into these companies, into the space, into these projects. And so there is a lot of growth on the horizon and this should of course be very exciting for anybody who wants to get involved in this. So yeah, given these things that I'm talking about, you know, could very well be likely that carbon removal could be a trillion dollar industry. You know, if it's 10 gigatons per year and each ton transacted uh, is $100 per ton, which is uh, some people call it the holy grail of the carbon removal industry. And it's a trillion dollar industry, uh, which is pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, there's not many um, industries, I, I think, like especially new industries that maybe have that kind of uh, likelihood on the horizon, but the fact that we're going to need so much carbon removal and there are kind of substantial costs associated with it means that this will be a huge industry, one that will employ many, many people um, and thus become an important and influential part of society. Um, it's also going to require a lot of resources, you know, a lot of land, a lot of renewable energy, a lot of water, a lot of precious metals, you know, a lot of steel, a lot of concrete, you know, a lot of um, just like space that people might not necessarily be happy that, that it's taking up. You know, it's, there's already discussions about environmental justice and community engagement and the potential for some of these plants to disrupt wildlife or disrupt the feel of, of a community or bother people um, in the same way that many mega infrastructure projects do now. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, going to be a huge thing, you know, and that's why it makes sense to invest so much, so many resources uh, into it now to ensure that we're doing it correctly. So, you know, we kind of have 27 years uh, to make this happen, you know, to go from uh, approximately zero to like, uh, you know, 10, 10 gigatons a year. So it's definitely a huge challenge. So we really have to get into it now. So we have several more slides here, and then um, we'll have some time for uh, questions. So, um, yeah, this slide just talks a, a little bit about um, the different kinds of um, carbon removal. And so there's other, as I listen, as I note on the bottom here, there's other, um, there, there's, there's other kinds of carbon removal that, that aren't captured by this diagram, but many people kind of look at uh, these ones listed and, and view these as the primary pathways. So you have coastal blue carbon, so it's like restoring coastal ecosystems that can help uh, take up and store more CO2, albeit in temporary biological stocks. Uh, accelerated chemical weathering. So this can apply to mined rocks or potentially mine tailings from some kind of other mining operation. And it's possible to react those rocks with CO2 as a form of permanent geologic storage. Uh, there's the direct air capture, which has come up a few times, essentially just running atmospheric air over chemicals those chemicals absorb CO2. And then um, you put them in a confined environment, desorb that CO2, and then use it for underground uh, injection or making some kind of product. Uh, you can take a bunch of plants that as they were growing, uh, they took CO2 out of the atmosphere and then find a way to get the carbon from those plants underground for permanent storage. Increased soil sequestration is something I mentioned before. Um, which can range from doing new uh, varied agricultural practices uh, that uh, take up more carbon in the soil to even genetically modifying plants so that they grow larger and larger root systems. So there's, there's more um, carbonaceous content stored in the soil. And then there's all the forestry stuff, you know, restoring forests uh, or even adding forests where there were 
were not for us before. Um, ocean alkalization, ocean alkalinity enhancement, it's also called, or enhanced weathering uh, is a way that we can try to de-acidify the ocean uh, while also having the ocean take up more CO2 from the atmosphere uh, for eventually permanent storage on the bottom of the ocean as the carbon uh, reacts and then kind of sinks and falls to the bottom. And like I note on the bottom, there's like all these other methods to, um, because of the huge opportunity uh, and the huge need for this and the potential for these like, you could almost call them quirky technological solutions. People have really tried to expand their minds and really try to think of all these different solutions. And so I'd recommend, you know, uh, looking these up and just reading more about them. So it, some of these can be a huge, you know, rabbit hole with multiple papers studied. Some of these, you know, something you've never even heard of yet. There's multiple companies working on it and people have raised millions of dollars trying to, you know, pursue these pathways to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And um, in some ways it's, it's, you know, really cool and, and, and quite inspiring. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of these methods. Um, for each method though, there are different like attributes or aspects that, that matter. So one might say, well, why don't we just find like the best method and just do that, do that one at scale. And that might be a little bit how this whole project organically evolves. But the trouble is that some, there are scalability limitations for a lot of these different methods. They might only be able to uh, scale to be so large uh, per year, just due to various resource constraints or um, other issues. And so we'll probably need some kind of mix of it. And also different regions are just suited uh, better for, for different kinds of carbon removal. And so these are some of just the different um, things to, to consider when like assessing different pathways and kind of comparing them. Uh, you know, of course, like cost matters, also economic viability. Can, you know, does the process have any like valuable co-products that can help underwrite it? Uh, what kinds of energy materials does it require? How does it impact the environment? You know, maybe it does take up carbon and store it underground, but maybe it produces a bunch of carcinogenic materials or involves a bunch of land use or something like that that can have other effects on society that we may want to manage or control. So we don't get this, you know, so-called carbon tunnel vision. Um, different processes might have different risks. There's different risks of reversal of the CO2 that's stored, you know, ultimately finding its way back up in, into the atmosphere. Speaking of that, there's this issue of permanence, which I mentioned a little earlier. So this is just something to keep in mind that the how long the CO2 is stored matters and that oftentimes people want something with a longer term storage. You know, uh, there's different schemes where some people might say um, like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'll plant this crop and then it will take up CO2 like as it's growing and as it establishes the biomass or whatever. Uh, but as soon as you maybe harvest that and there's a bunch of residue just decaying in a field, well, like all that CO2 is going to escape back into the atmosphere. So it's not really a permanent form. And then you have to ask, is it really having any climate impact? Like, yeah, it kind of temporarily removes some carbon, maybe temporarily takes a little bit of pressure off the radiative forcing that's warming the, the climate. But why would you pay for something, uh, assuming it's the same price that stores CO2 for 10 years when you could store it for 10,000? Um, and so there's, there's a lot of debate about this because a lot of these different processes, they just naturally or inherently just have different storage. And then once you get out so far, it's like even a hundred years in the future, let alone a thousand or 10,000, nobody's going to be checking. Nobody remembers. There's no enforceability for something that far in the future. So uh, it's like a very contentious issue in the space. Different people debate about how we should handle it. Uh, something that a lot of people are kind of settling on is a like for like emitting or offsetting strategy. So a lot of what funds carbon removal, which I talk about in the next slide or two, is uh, voluntary offsets. So it's someone who emits and they pay so much money to some carbon removal person to you know, take that uh, CO2 out of the air and, and permanently store it. A lot of people think it's not really appropriate if you have some kind of permanent fossil emission, you know, some carbon that you're digging up from deep underground and then you're spewing it out into the atmosphere to warm the world. Um, but then you pay for just like a, per, uh, temporary storage of that ton that, that you emitted, like 
if you pay for that temporary storage, but then that carbon just gets back in the atmosphere, like you, you should be liable again. You shouldn't be able to just pay for temporary storage and just kind of like, you know, wash your hands clean of it. So a lot of people think there should be this kind of like for like thing where if you emit permanent emission, permanent carbon that's been underground for millions of years that you should probably pay for some kind of permanent removal that's going to, in all likelihood, take that carbon and store it back underground for millions of years. Uh, but if you want to buy an offset for like some sort of land use change thing that you did, well, then it's uh, more reasonable to say, if, well, if you deforested land, maybe you pay for reforestation elsewhere. You know, maybe that's more of a like for like and kind of a fairer uh, offsetting strategy. But that's something that the industry has to kind of determine because this is the voluntary carbon market. And so here on this slide, I just outlined some of the different ways that carbon removal companies make money or hope to make money. So there's the voluntary offsets, there's just people or companies who are, um, you could say out of the goodness of their own hearts, just, you know, um, saying, well, we emit, but we uh, don't want to emit as much. So we're just going to, you know, pay these companies to suck this carbon back up. Uh, increasingly, there are some standards, some like corporate, you know, emissions accounting standards that are calling for carbon removal as a tool in the toolkit for reducing emissions. So maybe as a company, you try as best you can, but there are still emissions in your supply chain that you just have no control over. So maybe you got to pay for carbon removal to compensate for those to call yourself a carbon neutral company. Uh, there's compliance offsets. So there might be certain markets like emissions trading markets, say in the EU or in California, like with the low carbon fuel standard, LCFS here, where you can maybe Maybe people have to, by law, reduce their emissions, and maybe purchasing carbon removal is one way they can do it. Uh, you might be able to sell some uh, products. So some people are trying to capture CO2 from the atmosphere and make like artificial graphite or carbon nanotubes, which are pretty valuable. Then you can sell those and then try to recoup some of the costs associated with carbon removal. Uh, government procurement. So in the recent omnibus package, a lot of people were excited because the Department of Energy is apparently getting some funding to do some direct government procurement of carbon removal, or at least they're gearing up for that. There's also tax credits that were passed as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. So if you remove carbon from the atmosphere permanently, uh, you get, I think it's $180 per ton, assuming you meet a variety of requirements. And so, yeah, that's pretty good. Not probably enough to cover the cost of, uh, for, for a lot of companies today, but still, still pretty good. And that could be a great source of revenue philanthropic support. Some people are looking into just uh, buying removals just for the good of the planet. Uh, and then this co-product monetization, kind of similar to the long-lived products, but maybe different. So sometimes processes, uh, they might store carbon, but also produce biochar, algal biofuel, green hydrogen, something that you can also sell into a commodity market and then get some funds to help offset the cost. So um, yeah, there's, there's, Still a lot of issues to be resolved in CDR. I mean, again, we're scaling this massive industry. So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, and so there's a website I've posted here uh, from a very popular organization that's doing uh, pre-purchasing of carbon removals called Frontier Climate. And they've listed a lot of knowledge gaps that are, are really interesting. And it's a really good source to look into for people who are looking for opportunities to make a big impact on the space. Um, and then I listed some other things in the bottom here that are some existing issues that need to be resolved in carbon removal to help the industry scale up. Um, you know, so the bottom scale, scale, scale. I mean, that's really the focus of what a lot of us are trying to do in the industry right now. And so really anything that can support that mission is, is valuable. Um, and I'll just note too, you know, I think this is uh, my last slide. There are so many ways to get involved. So it might feel like, you know, carbon removal is this new thing. I haven't heard much about it. You know, it's, it's hard to break into. Uh, definitely understandable. It certainly has not gotten as much press or attention or funding even as many of these other mainstream climate solutions. Uh, many people might not even learn about carbon removal until like uh, later in their lives even. And so, uh, but, but with that said, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of great ways to get involved. And the things I've listed on this slide are just like a sample of what's out there. You know, there's, there's like hundreds of companies uh, coming onto the scene now. Um, tons of job postings. I would check out this carbon removal jobs. 
um, for, for some leads, but yeah, a ton of internships, jobs, volunteer opportunities, like through open air. Um, th- there's just so much going on and yeah, for anyone who wants to get involved, there's, there's definitely ways. So, uh, yeah, with that, thanks for, uh, listening today and yeah, now we can have some time to do some questions or, uh, yeah, chat about anything else that's on anyone's mind. So yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Grant. That was awesome. Uh, that was a really uh, great overview of all the products. I jotted down a, a, all the different aspects of the uh, carbon dioxide removal. I jotted down a question or two. Uh, if people have questions in the audience, feel free to put them into the uh, Q&A, uh, but I'm going to start it first. Um, it, it, you mentioned you know, this product, the, 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 this Space seems somewhat overwhelming, uh, but it's also kind of an opportunity. What is the aspect of it that excites you the most? That excites me the most. I think, I mean, this is slightly a personal answer, I guess, but I guess I like the fact that there, and I'm excited about the fact that there are all these opportunities for people to work in jobs that are like actively restorative or actively good for the climate. Because I imagine, um, you know, let's say you're uh, alive in 1970 and you're 25 years old and looking for a way to like start your life and you know, climate change is a big deal, but you need to like earn money to pay rent and pay for your food and stuff. Uh, If you were alive at that time, it was like, maybe there were a few climate like themed things that you could do and maybe try to get paid for, but in all likelihood, no, you would probably have to participate in this kind of mainstream economy and, and just try to donate some money on the side, maybe volunteer, do, do the best you can. But now what I think is like sick about, about carbon removal is that you have this amazing industry, super well-funded, super exciting, technically challenging, uh, and just captivating for so many. Um, but you can make a living doing it, you know, and you can like pour the majority of your waking hours into it. And Yeah love it. And, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I guess I'm excited that that opportunity uh, is, is going to exist for so many people. Do you have a favorite form you mentioned, you know, you went through, did a great job of sort of overviewing the different uh, possible approaches for the uh, CDR. And obviously, you know, there's probably more an exhaustive list, but uh, you covered the, the, the main ones that, that the, I think are the, the things that people are focusing on the most right now. Do you if I have ones that you personally find the most promising? Yeah, I mean, I think there are different, like different solutions just have different benefits or different co-benefits for, for communities. You know, I, I'm pretty interested in like charm industrials to, in their approach or in anything where you can pyrolyze uh, biomass or agricultural residues or forestry residues or anything like that to get either bio oil or gas, uh, gaseous CO2 for permanent storage, but also get green hydrogen which can be used for heating or in industry or transportation as well. And I think that provides a, a decent business model as well. But uh, there's a special place in my heart for direct air capture because, you know, it can be powered by non-arable land and um, yeah, it just has so much scaling potential and it's just such like a brute force solution to this problem. Um, but the one that like will probably work to in a very large way. And so that one is a special place in my heart. And I'm increasingly interested in ocean based approaches too. I mean, those I think have so much potential and could be really cheap, but also offer permanent storage that, um, but also not take up, you know, too much like arable or non-arable land that they, they could be really interesting. So yeah, yeah that's I- kind of all of them though, <laughs> though. <laughs> and also <by> a <laughs> um, one of the things that I, I really, um, I really love about uh, the idea behind uh, carbon removal is it's like we're reverse terraforming the planet back to what it used to be before uh, we created so many issues with it. Um, at one point, you mentioned that uh, forest offsets uh, were dubious. Uh, can you clarify uh, why that is? Yeah, definitely. And I'll actually tie it in. So we got a question that came in in the Q&A from them all about, yeah, what is the cheapest CDR method and what's the most scalable? So forestry is probably the cheapest. Um, but there's just issues with, with forestry. So there's, there's like all sorts of different 
issues that can range from the additionality uh, to leakage to permanence. And so, you know, it's, it's not that expensive to say, protect a forest from uh, being deforested when, when it's about to be. Um, but that's not really carbon removal, that's more of emissions reduction. So I guess I can change it to like reforesting. So there's a company, I think it's called Drone Seed, uh, and they like use drones to plant seeds uh, to yeah, grow new forests. And it's an awesome idea. I think it's totally captivating and we should do as much of that as we possibly can. Um, and it's probably pretty cheap, you know, to just plant these seeds uh, and then just let nature kind of run its course. Um, but it's, it's not always quite that simple. Uh, sometimes the trees need active management, but like um, an issue with it has to do with the permanence of the CO2 storage uh, in those trees, especially uh, with a change in climate. So as the world heats up, as pests spread, um, it just might not be so clear that those trees will uh, actually store carbon for the long term. Uh, there can be social issues as well. Um, I think this happened with like the UN uh, Red program, uh, where there was like land grabs and just really funky stuff that was going on. Uh, again, in in the global south, often um, with indigenous people as the victims to like get land to plant a bunch of trees to kind of claim these emissions credits, then use it as an excuse to like you know burn more coal or, or whatever. There's also leakage issues. Sometimes you. Um, you might like preserve a forest somewhere, but it raises global timber prices. And then it leads to someone on the margin elsewhere in the world to get into the timber market and deforest their land. And maybe deforesting their land will add more carbon to the atmosphere than just deforesting the original land. And so you think you're generating an offset, but you're not really, and you're actually doing worse and that kind of stuff. Um, sometimes uh, there was a big example with the buffer pools in California. So they were doing these forestry offsets and they were planting extra trees as a kind of buffer to guard against if any of the trees died or burned down. But then they didn't really take into account that, well, when some trees burn, a lot of trees burn. And it, if there's a wildfire, it could be a bad wildfire season. And then the buffer pool burned too. And so the insurance that they had didn't work because there was kind of like correlated risk between all these assets, almost like the financial crisis in a way. So yeah, there's just a lot of issues. It's not saying we shouldn't do it, like we should do it, but we need to do other things as well. And we should be very careful of any kind of strategy where like some big oil company is justifying their emissions by planting trees somewhere. Uh, and we need to be very careful about social impacts of, of those processes too. Thanks. Yeah, that, that's a great answer. And I think it's very important for people to be aware of the sort of, you know, planting trees is great and seems great, but you know sometimes there are, are some uh, pitfalls that people are not aware of. Um, I'm going to keep working through some of these questions. If you have more questions in the audience, feel free to put them into the Q and A. Um, but one of the business models you mentioned was uh, producing long-lived products, uh, such as carbon nanotubes. Can you explain a little bit about what those are uh, and why they're so valuable? Yeah. So, in terms of the long-lived products. Frankly, there's not that many. Um, there's some people who talk about uh, these carbon nanotubes, which are just valuable for various industries. But the issue there is that the global scale isn't that large. I think there's only like what something ridiculously small, like 10 tons per year or something of carbon nanotubes because they're often used in very small amounts. Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe that will grow quickly, but it's just not like a huge market right now. And it can be very expensive to go from captured gaseous CO2 into the carbon nanotube. And so it adds a lot of costs. So um, you can sell it for a lot, but a lot of that money will just be recouping that those conversion costs. Uh, there's discussion of um, yeah, so, like a solid carbon or ca uh, carbon black, which is like, a, I think it's like a pigment. So I think you can use it in like ink. And I think they use it in tires as well. Again, like, yeah, it's something you can sell, but we already kind of get that from petroleum. And in some ways that it, it's, I don't want to say it's carbon neutral because petroleum is not carbon neutral. It's very dirty, you know, refining emissions and so forth. But when you derive, you know, when you drill for petroleum and then make it into carbon black and then, um, or you're using coal or something like that, and that carbon ends up in a tire, if that tire is like buried in a landfill somewhere, it's not necessarily the case that the, that carbon for that carbon black is going to get into the atmosphere. So it's um, maybe, yeah, 
like it's a way to remove carbon, but it's it's maybe not the most pressing. And, and again, the scale isn't isn't totally massive. Uh, there's some people investigating graphite and like taking captured CO2, making it into graphite and then using that graphite in batteries. And I don't, there's very few companies that are like active doing that. Um, and again, there's just challenges in that conversion process, but that's an interesting market um, because of batteries, a lot of uh, batteries that we need for electrification uh, and energy s- storage on the grid. Um, they, they use graphite. And so there's kind of a big, big demand for that. Um, but again, yeah, there's, there's just challenges in, in converting the CO2. And the final one that probably does have a lot of potential right now is aggregates, so like mineral carbonation, um, mineral carbon international, mineral carbonation, international MCI, they, um, are investigating using like captured CO2 and then reacting it with various rocks and then selling that aggregate into say construction markets as like a filler or something like that. And, and that's really cool because that's long lived carbon and they immediately have a, a product that they can sell. And so it's, it's like a good built-in business model. Uh, circling back to Amal's question in, in the Q and A. Um, so it seems like the answer is kind of like the forestry, but there are, it, that's problematic in some of the ways that you mentioned. What do you feel like is the, the combination of like least problematic and uh, most affordable as today uh, slash most scalable or, or separate that those are two separate things in your mind? Yeah, I think it's a lot of it's pretty separate. You know, there, there's different um, analyses and in, in different papers that come out on this topic. There was one that came out recently that was like, um, I'm trying to remember what it was called. It was like a multi-criteria assessment of carbon removal technologies or negative emissions technologies or something along those lines. And they were analyzing a lot of these different pathways in a lot of these different dimensions. And I think they settled on like direct air capture and enhanced weathering as, as being two of the, yeah, like most promising in terms of all these different categories. But a lot of it is to be seen. You know, we kind of have to start scaling these up because there will be unforeseen problems and issues with, with all of them. Um, yeah, it's a, a lot of people lean pretty heavily into direct air capture because in some sense, it's a very, very direct form and it's something that can really be optimized and hopefully one day reach that, you know, 50 to $150 per ton level. Um, and it can make use of either say like uh, nuclear energy, which is very uh, dense in terms of the land area it takes up, or it can use, you know, like wind or solar that's uh, on non-arable land, which is important for preserving agricultural area and forestry, for preserving uh, food prices and food security and so forth. Um, And it can just be optimized to just be so efficient in terms of space. And so, and then you can just take the CO2 and just inject it right underground. So there's, there's no games of permanence or this, that, or the other thing. Uh, some of the ocean methods, it can be very hard to measure, even though we're getting increasingly good at modeling and hopefully one day measuring how much carbon the ocean's taking up as we increase its alkalinity or so forth. But uh, with direct air capture, there's there's less uncertainty, which is, okay, you know, we're taking the CO2 right from the atmosphere, injecting it underground for permanent storage, very optimized, very efficient. So I think a lot of people are pinning a lot of hopes on that. Um, so uh, this is a little bit of a curveball for the last question, um, but uh, you, since you brought it up during your talk, uh, I just wanted to say that you you mentioned uh, ge- geoengineering as sort of a separate path from uh, CDR for keeping uh, global temperatures down. Uh, can you explain just briefly, some of our viewers might not be as familiar with geoengineering, uh, what it is and, uh, and uh, why <laughs> some of the positives and negatives of it? Yeah, I would say the most... A very common form of geoengineering is it's traditionally understood as solar radiation management, where we uh, purposely inject like sulfate aerosols into the atmosphere and they reflect sunlight. uh, And then that that reflection of sunlight or reflection of the sun's infrared energy uh, cools the planet a little bit. And we can do this in a a controlled way. Um, I think it's... It's controversial because of uh, various reasons. There's an issue of termination shock, where if we were to start doing something like that, if we were to suddenly stop, then the climate could warm uh, very quickly, um, more quickly and, and 
to potentially to a higher level than if we had never started in the first place. And so there's that fear. Um, there's a fear with a lot of these uh, geoengineering techniques that they could have like adverse impacts on different parts of the world. And so maybe the um, aerosol injection would prevent, you know, prevent sunlight. So it doesn't heat up our planet as much, but it might adversely affect crops that are growing. And like one of the big reasons that we want to fight climate change to begin with is to preserve our agricultural output so that we can have more food to feed people. And so food can be cheaper. Uh, and so we'd kind of just be, it would be like self-defeating if we mm-hmm. you know, tried to reflect all this sunlight, but then hurt the very crops that we're trying to save. And then there can also be geopolitical or even like a military application of these things where uh, one country deploys them and maybe it benefits their climate, but maybe it screws over the climate of, or the crops or so forth of the, of the country next to them. And so it's something that needs to be internationally governed, but uh, international governance adds like this whole layer of complexity into doing it. Also, And there's also a high degree of techno- technological uncertainty and a lot of um, people... I think even organizations uh, want or have tried to enact like a moratorium on even testing these things because they don't even want humanity to go down that path. There's also this moral hazard argument that if we have some like easy but slightly dangerous, you know, solution to climate change, that we'll just do that and then we won't change our ways. Like um, it would be like, uh, I don't know, your arm is sawed off and you just keep taking more Tylenol or something like that. <laughs> like, uh, eventually you're going to run out of Tylenol or it's not going to work or you're going to bleed to death or something. It, maybe not the perfect analogy, but um, yeah, there, there are those issues. Personally though, I am interested in geoengineering and, and I actually personally think that there could be a, uh, an intimate relationship between geoengineering and carbon removal. Also geoengineering is weird because we're already geoengineering the planet by spewing unprecedented amounts of carbon into the atmosphere uh, at an unprecedented rate and totally interfering with the climate system. So we're like already geoengineering it. So the wrong way. (laughs) Yeah, this is the wrong way. And and I think from like a utilitarian perspective, if we could do something that would cause other pains, but create net good that we should think about it. Um, But I also tend to think that that risk of positive feedback loops is very scary. You know, if three degrees Celsius can turn into four, can turn into five, you know, if, the, if there's even a small risk of that runaway climate change, it's up to us to try to minimize that risk. And um, I've sometimes wondered and thought, would it make sense to do geoengineering, but just temporarily while we both reduce our emissions and use carbon removal to draw down atmospheric concentration. So in that way we could prevent like the worst ever hitting the kind of worst temperatures um, and also buy ourselves some time to like pull things back, but then also not have to take that risk where if we start doing it now, we have to do it forever. And we also risk termination shock. Should we ever, should society ever reach a point where we can't do the geoengineering anymore or there's some kind of active intervention in it. So I don't know, that kind of combination interests me, but we'd have to do it really responsibly. And if you don't have a lot of faith in humanity, and in international governance, then it's probably not a, it's probably not something you should, you should, you know, advocate for. For me, it's just the idea is like, you know, we couldn't stop burning fossil fuels. So instead we checked it, we, had, we resorted to changing how reflective the planet is, uh, at least temporarily to offset it. It's, it's just, it's a future generation is going to find that kind of a, a crazy story that's like, really, that's, that was easier than just uh, switching over to, renewables and then getting uh, carbon removal going um, but you know we'll, we'll we'll have to see where that goes but on that note uh thanks so much grant this is really amazing uh great way to kick off our webinar series uh and you will be back next week uh talking about life cycle analysis uh and techno uh techno life cycle and techno economic assessment um and that is next week january 19th at 11 a.m eastern time Uh, You can find the link on our website and also a GCAL invite. You can add that to your calendar. We'll also be sending out a, um, a, uh, an email, but we actually did just get one more question in the Q and A. Are you up for one more question, Grant? Uh, Yeah, this might be a question for you. Um, Yeah. yeah. It's about the carbon removal challenge. Let me see. I haven't actually read it yet. Now I'm going to look at it. Um, 
there is no fixed amount uh, or range of CO2 uh, expected in this. We're going to be evaluating the uh, different solutions against each other. So uh, obviously we are going to be looking for people who are as impactful as possible, but there's not some sort of minimum or maximum <laughs> presumably uh, range of uh, CO2 removal that we're looking for or carbon dioxide removal looking for uh, to have. So um, we're really gonna judge the submissions against each other. Uh, and we're really excited to see what you all come up with. Uh, so hopefully that answers your question and we will see hopefully most of you back here next week. Again, that is January 19th at 11 a.m. Eastern time. Uh, right, we're gonna be back here with Grant Faber again, talking about life cycle and techno-economic assessment uh, for carbon removal. Thanks everybody, appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you all. <laughs>